Ladies and gentlemen, in this video, we are going to answer a relatively straightforward question that might be on many of your minds. And that question is, should you spend money on the game of chess? Now, the answer to this question could then extend to other parts of your life and answer a more broad question like, should I spend money on any of my hobbies? Will it make me happy? Will it make me improve? The way this video is structured is I will have an overarching document guideline by which we will go. Then I will show you three examples of individuals who have spent money on chess and in my opinion have spent money more the correct way than not the correct way. They are subscribers, they are volunteers, very brave. And I've never made a video like this, so we're going to see how it goes. Here's the overarching document that we will drive this video by. Are chess courses a waste of money? And our guiding light will be no, but, or yes, if. All right? Chess courses are not a waste of money if you ensure the material you are learning is applicable, if you choose quality over quantity, and if you do not, if you understand that spending money does not equal results. Chess courses are a waste of money if you don't study accurately or you fake study, you are not the correct level for the course, or you cheat. And the last two things to remember are progress is not linear and you need to spend within your limits. And now we are going to get into the volunteers. But right before we do that, let's, let's just address something from a, a very straightforward philosophical perspective. And let's also remember that I am mildly biased in the sense that I literally do have chess courses, right? That is one major component of Gotham Chess. If you enjoy the videos, you may or may not enjoy some of my courses. Opening courses, beginner courses, middle game courses, end game tactics, etc. Um, so... Why would anybody spend money on anything, right? Like, I suppose we should get philosophical like that. Well, it, let's say provided you, you have the money to spend. That's a very good starting point. Some, everybody's in a different spot financially, right? We're also all over the world. Different currencies are worth different things. So really the first stepping stone is, can you? I mean, beyond that, like, are you a teenager or are you an adult with a job? You might be an adult with a job, but you're not in a position where you can afford to spend 60, 80, 100 dollars on chess or another hobby that you might have. And that's okay. You might be watching this as a 12 year old and you're not gonna be able to convince your parents to buy you a chess course. Regardless, that's the first step. Like I have had people reach out to me and say, hey, I'm waiting for my next paycheck uh, and then I'm gonna get this course, but you know, w your sale is gonna expire, so would you mind extending the sale to me? I've gotten emails like that and it's like, I don't think you should be investing in a hobby that might not have a payoff if you're waiting for your next paycheck. You understand what I'm saying? Like that is a very important component, number one. Number two, let's say that's met. Let's say you do wanna spend some money on your hobby. I spend money on my hobbies. I like tennis, I like squash. Uh, you know, I, uh, we, we like hiking sometimes. Like in New York, you don't always rent a car. Uh, you don't always own a car. It, we don't, so you, you, know, you, you might rent a car. You might do something along those lines, but I like to spend money on, on certain things. Uh, if you like reading, you're gonna buy books. You know, if you, if you like doing certain things, you're gonna buy puzzles, you're gonna, you're gonna, whatever. You're gonna spend a little bit of money on things that you enjoy because they make you happy. Same applies to chess. Now, can you learn chess for zero dollars? Probably, but the experience of learning chess, especially as an adult, spending no money is a daunting one. It's not that easy. For those of you that have done it, it's a lot of bootstrap effort. Like, it's the same as going to the gym and, you know, you, you don't really spend money on supplements or personal training or anything. Like, you just, you just go to the gym a lot. And it, it's possible, but some people like to work with a trainer. Some people like a coach teaching them how to play tennis and improving at tennis, like for me. So, it depends. Like, it depends what your situation is. Can you afford it? And remember, quality over quantity. Don't overspend money. Now, Let's jump into certain examples. Example number one, which I'm going to get into right now, is a person named Ian, right? Ian is rated around 1100, all right? And Ian uh, sent me this game. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to go one by one, all right? I'm going to go in reverse. Actually, Ian's information is unknown. And Ian said, before I bought the E4 course, I only played the Ponziani, didn't like the positions. I really wanted something offbeat, and the Vienna was the perfect choice. I study once every two or three days for a few hours. 
Uh, ever since I got the course, I only play what's in the E4 course. I've been a monster. Always remember the 69% win rate with the Gambit. Thank you, Gotham. Uh, you're welcome, Ian. Let's keep this in mind. You must ensure the, the stuff you spend money on is applicable. It's not too high level. It's not too low level. And he got one course. He did not buy all the courses. You don't have to buy all the courses. You don't have to buy all the stuff. Let's see how he does. He studies for a little bit, a couple hours a day. So the funny thing to me is that he sent me this game. And this was a game that he beat a 900, right? He played the Vienna. He played the Vienna Gambit. His opponent accepted it. He played pawn to e5. His opponent pinned the pawn to the king. He blocked, went here, and his opponent immediately lost the game with this move d6. Now, I want you all to pay attention because this, everything you see here, all of this is actually covered for free. You can actually get this for free. You say, what are you talking about? Yeah. So he bought the E4 course, but it just so happens that if you go to my courses website, click on courses, go to the E4 course and click start the free sample, because there's a free sample. Every course comes with a free sample. It just so happens that literally the very first thing was e4, e5, knight c3, f4, and then you pin the pawn to the king, and then you stop the check, d6, and this position, look at this position, knight to d5. Look at his game. Knight to d5, it's the same exact position. It just so happens that the free sample is really applicable to the 1000 level. In the, in the, in the game, uh, Ian's opponent did not play the best move, which is this, and not losing the queen. In the game, Ian's opponent went here, or rather, that he went there first, and then Ian took and took all his pieces. Okay, he actually did play the best move, but then, then he blundered his queen. So he actually did play all of that. Now, Ian has the rest of the course, so Ian's obviously going to learn all of this and, and have a very good win rate in the Vienna. And the incredible thing is, he used to play like a pretty, you know, solid E4, E5. He actually scored quite decently. He wins 73% of his games with the Vienna. 73%! That is insane! That is nuts! And he studies it every now and then for a couple of hours a day. And clearly he's had success. So for Ian, who I believe is an adult, I don't know if he has kids, I don't know if he's, I don't know. But it seems like for him, one course, one course is not a waste of money. Now, if Ian had like six courses, he spent too much money. You know, there's no point. You can't wear all six pairs of shoes. There's no point buying six pairs of shoes. With a course, you gotta go slowly. That's what I think, especially if you're like a thousand, you need a little bit of time. So quality over quantity, and the quality is high. The quality is high, clearly it's working. And here's a slightly longer game, which, you know, was not exactly, th this is now chapter two and three of the Vienna, okay? So Ian has a, the, the E4 course, and he, he misplayed it, you know? His opponent played in a very weird way, his 1100 rated blitz opponent. And what you're supposed to do here is you're really not supposed to push so quickly, but the opening gives Ian confidence, and confidence is what you need when you play, when you when you pay for something. All right, if you're play, if you're paying for tennis lessons, soccer, basketball, like you go to personal training, you go to the gym, whatever. Ian sacrifices a bishop. It's completely the wrong move. It's not what he's supposed to do, but because he's fueled with the Vienna, he just goes for it. I mean, it's changed his playing style, right? He plays an opening that fits his playing style. He gives up material to create attacks and look at this. Look at that, I mean, it's, he didn't play it accurately, but it doesn't matter because he's playing an opening that he really enjoys. And pretty soon he picks up his opponent's pieces. He doesn't convert the game perfectly. He's 1100, what are you gonna do? But the point is, if you're gonna invest in something, right? If you're gonna invest in your hobby, uh, you gotta have fun doing it. And clearly he's having fun doing it. As you can see from his statistics, the Vienna, he's crushing, even if the games aren't perfect. The games that he's getting, the types of positions he's getting, they clearly fit his style. So in this particular case, this is not a waste of money. Now I'm assuming Ian did not go in debt over this, because if he did, then it, val it completely invalidates the whole first thing, right? But the money that you invest on stuff like this should, you know, and, and the same with like chess.com game review. Like if, if, if it makes your life a lot easier and you learn a lot better than just like analyzing every individual move of a game on your own, well, well, then great. You want to do, you know, puzzles. You want to have a huge lesson library. Terrific. But in this particular case for Ian, this is not, uh, this is not money poorly spent. All right. And clearly he's enjoying himself and, you know, he's enjoyed the video. So, so, so he picks up the Vienna and clearly it's going well for him. Now, 
Gotham sub number one, we're gonna bounce from three to one here because I wanted to go in ascending order. So the next person is uh, up to about 1200 rapid. Uh, 1200 rapid says, college student, bought the Dutch course September 24th, right? So about four months ago. Thoroughly enjoyed learning playing the Dutch. It's an offbeat fighting style opening, swashbuckling, uh, and um, I struggled to learn what to do against the Staunton Gambit uh, and other sidelines such as Knight C3 before C4. However, I finished the course before my winter break from college. I loved the opening so much. I really dove into the other things, and now uh, this person actually even bought a book. So he bought a book in addition to the course. So was that money well spent? He bought a Dutch course and even bought a Dutch book to study games. Okay, well, again, I'm assuming he had the financial means to do so. So the next question is, is that the best approach as in 1189? From a pure chess standpoint, they're about the same. Like, studying the openings versus, like, you don't need to buy a book. I'm sure if you, if you really wanted, like I said, if you really wanted, you probably could do it for free. You just, it would require a lot of Googling and making a doc and finding the right games. And, you know, again, this person likes the Dutch. So like, which Dutch? Was it the Leningrad, Was right? So you, you could always argue you could do it for free, but this person probably enjoys sitting there looking at games that Grandmasters played in the Dutch. So for them, that investment is worth it. Then they have the Gotham course, right? Like they have the Dutch course. So this person, Diego, here shows, you know, shows a game that, that they played. And this is the Gotham Dutch, right? You play Knight C3, Bishop B4, you pin, and the, and the position that they got from the opening is exactly what you're supposed to do in the Dutch. Now, the other thing is, if you're a 1189, like Diego, Diego's 1189, and let's say you're 1189, you want to learn the Knight of Sicilian. So you want to learn E4, C5, okay? Knight at 3, D6, D4, C, D, Knight, D4, Knight of 6, Knight, D3, A6, Bishop, G5, E6, F4, Bishop, E7, Queen, F3, Queen, C7, blah, 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 blah. Here's the problem. Your opponents are not going to play any of that. You are never, ever, ever, ever going to see this position. You're never going to see this position, let alone this position, or this, or this, and this goes back, 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 back. You might never even see this position as an 1189, because at 1100, people are playing the Smith Mora, they're playing the, the, the Alipin, the God knows what, you know, they might be playing whatever, whatever. But in the Dutch, you actually do face this quite a bit. Like, the chance that your opponent plays c4, knight f6, knight c3, like, this position is very popular. And then you play your Dutch. So the chance that you replicate what you are learning, material is applicable. You are spending money on something that will appear in your games. Okay? That is very important. Now, Mr. Alec, uh, Mr. Diego, uh, plays this in a way that, you know, this is a weird setup by White. He plays here, right, trying to play bishop to b7. Doesn't quite get the position that he would like, but, you know, his opponent is playing some very silly stuff. And Black is just doing very, very, very okay. Now, at this point, this has nothing to do with the opening anymore. This is kind of like the position that the opening dropped you in, and now, now you have to play chess. Like, now you have to play chess. You know, I, I personally, me, I see a rook and a queen and a king, so I want to play d6, I want to play e5. He does this, puts his knight on c4, tries to open up the center, you know, like, it's a very complex battle, and he finds a nice tactic, and, and the game spills out into a rook endgame. All right, like, this, this is, the opening no longer matters, so if you go on to win this game, which Diego did, you can't really say the opening was the reason, but did the opening drop you in a position where life is good and you were doing quite well? Yeah. If after 10 moves with black, you're minus 0.7, obviously it's applicable. Now, Diego's gonna have a game where, you know, like he said, he struggled against Staunton Gambit, right? So that Gambit. But he's gonna have a game where he's, go he's literally just going to play everything that he knows in this opening, right? And he's gonna get this position. And this is, this, this is what the course teaches you. Right, like the course teaches you to get this position, the Dutch. And you're just doing fine. You're equal, your knight's gonna go there, your pawn's gonna go there, your knight's gonna go there, your other knight's gonna go there. And your position plays itself. And so, Diego, since learning the Dutch, is scoring approximately, approximately, the same score he used to in the modern, but, and I found this out by going to opening tree. This is openingtree.com. Uh, 
this was uh, this was uh, these were the stats of Ian. Okay, um, I think I called Ian. I might have called Ian Alex uh, because uh, Ian's second opponent was named Alex. Um, anyway, what I learned looking at Diego's games is that Diego struggles against the London. But he never struggled against the London when he played the Modern. So this is the way you improve your chess courses, okay? What you do is, oh, I used to play the Modern against the London, and I would get some good positions. So what should you do? If they play the London against you, why don't you go back to that? Why don't you play G6? So I noticed that Diego plays a lot of E6 against London, but what about this? And you do what you did previously. You play like this. So you combine what you're successful at, right? Diego really liked to play the modern and against the London was winning a lot. But then he switched to the Dutch and he started losing a lot to the London. But that's because he changed this whole approach. You can combine the Dutch with the modern, right? You could play the same exact setup. So that's how it works. And now again, should Diego buy a book and a course? Maybe it might be slight overkill, but if he can afford it, Whatever, do what makes you happy. You know what I mean? Like, the, the, it might not necessarily be the best thing. If Diego then went and hired a Grandmaster coach to teach him about the Dutch, that would be overkill, especially at 1200. But if he's happy and he's having a good time and he's learning, then great, do what you want. Now from 1200, from around 900 to, to 1200, now we're gonna go all the way up to 1700. Now this one is, is really interesting. So. This is a father with a full-time manual labor job, like picking up chess pieces and putting them down, over 30 years old, bought a Carl Kahn course back in 2021, said, I started playing chess after my brother-in-law watched The Queen's Gambit. Typical story. He beat me, so I YouTubed how to win a chess in 2020. Your videos came up. I've been hooked ever since. Bought all the courses and study about an hour or so a day when I can. So this is actually a pretty common thing. And again, I'm very thankful, and there are people who definitely do this. I've had people reach out and say, you know what, Gotham? I have watched... 70 of your videos. I, I watch the video every day during the pandemic. I've watched, uh, not 70, 700. That's what I meant to say. I watch the video every single day. Like I eat food, I watch the video. So I'm gonna buy three of your courses because I just, you know, video watching doesn't pay, you know, doesn't pay you anything and, and, and that's fine. Like some people have literally bought courses and let them sit. You don't wanna buy courses and treat them like a gym membership. You know, you sign up for the gym, it's like 10 bucks a month. And you don't go, because you're like, whatever, it's 10 bucks, not a big deal. And this happens a lot. You buy something, and you get this monthly fee. Some people like to buy courses, but they don't open them. That's a waste of money. But if the argument is, well, I can afford it, and I want to support this person, and you know, I watch so much of their content, I don't mind. And when I get around to it, I get around to it. That's a personal decision. Like, at the end of the day, that, that, that's, that's a personal decision. That's completely fine. Uh, and trust me, creators who sell creator products, in my case, I sell chess courses. I don't sell much merchandise or, you know, other stuff, but um, everybody does appreciate it. Uh, but, you know, you, you don't really want to buy three courses, let's say, with the white pieces. Like, you don't want to buy E4, D4, and Gambits because you can't possibly study all of them. You really should try to specialize a little bit. You should try to learn a little bit here and there, but if you want to learn everything, learn something, start a little bit, Put a little effort into that and then and then move on. Now, the fascinating thing in this case, uh, oh my god, my nose is so itchy. I don't know what is going on, but I cannot get that itch out, and now I just look ridiculous. So in this particular case, um, this is the story of uh, of this person, right? First of all, this person is a is a dad. Like, good luck, all right. Good luck having a full time you know manual labor job, being a dad and then studying chess. And this person sent a couple of games, which I found very interesting. So this is Jeff. I believe this is Jeff. And Jeff is 1700 rapid after learning chess in 2020. I mean, you talk about a guy whose courses are justified being bought. I mean, shout out to Jeff, who has still found a way to play thousands of games. Now, Jeff's stats were very interesting. Jeff used to play E4, E5 very poorly. Had like a 60% win rate for white. Played the French, like E6, B6 stuff. Did okay. Then got the Carl Kahn course and started doing very well. Now, in this position, Jeff scores about 60% for black. It's the mainline position. Remember this approach to getting to the Vienna? Like, you know, you can get out of here, you can go to the courses, like I already showed. So the free sample is literally, if you go to the free sample, this first study, E4, C6, this is free. This is all for free. It's all on Chesley. 
c3, knight, c6, bishop to b5. That's all available for you for free. Knight c6, bishop b5. It's the same exact position. Same position. Right? It's all there. You go back, same position. So, or maybe it was here. Anyway, doesn't matter. Same position. Now, in the, this, you play queen a5. That's the right move. Now, Jeff didn't do that. So, Jeff has the course. He doesn't play it exactly accurately, but remember how Alex, I keep calling him Alex. Remember how Ian didn't play this exactly accurately? You know, remember how he didn't play this exactly accurately? And then he like sacrificed the piece and all this stuff. As long as you have a course and you're confident and you understand the positions, life is good. Jeff proceeds to put his queen here. Now, I really would have loved to see him play bishop a6 and stop white from castling, but he does this. And then he spots that the queen can't guard the pawn. He understands the ideas of his opening. If you understand the ideas of your opening, you're golden. You don't have to always play the moves that are in the course. It's not exactly how it works. Sometimes, yes. Frequently, no. Frequently, you can play things and you're going to be just fine. His opponent has to take with the pawn because he has to guard his pawn here. And after 10 moves, 15 moves, Jeff is just much better. He just has a great position. He can play bishop here. He can castle. It's exactly what he does. Right, he doesn't get into a crazy fight. And now here, he can push the advantage by playing this move. I would not trade the knight for the bishop here because you're undoubling your opponent's pawns. I would put the knight here and just slowly chip away. But this is a middle game situation. This is, we're, we're out of the opening now, right? Like now it's a question of, is this a good trade for white or for black? It's a better trade for white actually. Normally you want to trade knight for bishop, but that bishop is horrible. And white has a really bad structure. And what actually ends up happening in this game is, you know, white starts advancing. And white actually attacks you and, and gets back into the game because you, you help white untangle a little bit. So, and again, just like in, in the game that we just saw, this Dutch game, you, you, you don't win games always out of the opening as you get better. Like, you have to play chess. And you're going to see in this game, there's a lot of chaos. And like, Jeff finds a really nice tactic which is rook takes knight and he gets to the rook, but then it's like, check, he's like wide open, it's total chaos, his king runs and he defends himself and then he goes on to win the end game. But from the opening, you know, again, it's like a matter of he understands how to play against the structure. You get rid of the knight, you put the knight on f5. So obviously the Karl concourse was a good investment for Jeff, cause he's 1700. And he's winning 60% of his games from this position. But then I discovered something. I discovered that in another game that he played, and actually uh, so, so some of his other games, he doesn't do well in the exchange. And if you just buy a course and just play, then what you're doing is fake studying, all right? If you buy a course, learn a little, and then just e4, c6, e Karl Kahn, Karl Kahn, blah, 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 blah. So I noticed that actually in his statistics, he does not do that great against this. And the reason he doesn't do that great against this is he doesn't see it very often, but also, but also, in particular, when Jeff gets hit with a Panov, right, a Panov variation, what do I recommend in the Karl Concourse? I recommend putting the pawn on g6. This is my recommendation. You spent money to get my recommendation. I am recommending this to you. You paid money. This is the, what you are supposed to learn. Just like it's what you were supposed to learn in this Karl Khan, just like what it was, you know, again, it, like this is how this works. But Jeff in many games just plays, no, he just puts two knights. And then he puts the bishop here and that's not what I, you've been taught. So if you buy something, but you don't take care of it. If you don't put it into use, you're gonna get into some trouble. And yet, and yet, despite all that, this is a game where Jeff is outrated by 400 points. And still from the opening, he was completely fine. Jeff was beating somebody 400 points higher rated than him. This was like, I don't know, last year. This was, you know, now Jeff is like 1700 rapid. Jeff beating somebody. 400 points higher rated than him. He, he went on to lose this game. All right, he went on to lose. It was a long end game, and they got into a bishop end game, and 
Jeff lost the pawn, and then Jeff lost the king race and lost all his pawns and, you know, lost the game. But that's because he's 400 points lower rated. Was the opening a success? Oh, yeah. Look at this position. Of course this was a success. You know, he has at least a not worse position against somebody 400 points higher rated than him. Of course this is a good investment. But he's not playing the recommendation. So, again, his, his win rate in the Panov is super low. Super low. His win rate in the thing that he actually studied, which was the previous game, this position is actually quite high. And that's what you got to do. Now, if you have a bunch of courses sitting around, like Jeff said, you know, he said, I bought, you know, I bought all the courses to just support. You know, that's definitely really appreciated. But another request I get a lot is, hey, Gotham, I really like your content. I want to buy all your courses. Can you give me a one-time purchase discount? And the answer is no. Because I don't believe that's the right way to study chess. I think that is a waste of money. Courses are a waste of money if you're already struggling financially. Like, there is a balance between supporting your own hobby and making yourself happy and not paying your phone bill. All right? Then there's a balance of doing everything for free, trying to get all your analysis done for free, trying to get all your lessons, your openings done for free. But that comes at the cost of, like, what if you're 35 and have a kid and a family... Sometimes, especially if you're already employed, it's just easier to pay for something that takes you, that guides you in a much easier way, as long as it's applicable. You should not buy courses, even if they're made by the best players in the world, if they're not applicable for you. If you're 1,200 and you want to learn some of the most cutting-edge openings in the world, it's completely useless. You can spend $250 on a course, you can pay a top player to coach you for five hours and spend $500 to $1,000, will it be worth it? Probably not, because you might just go blunder a night in the next game you play. Or the opening that they teach you is just not applicable. So it's all a balancing act. Quality over quantity. Okay? Don't fake study. Study a little bit at a time. Also, don't read courses like books. Fiction books should be read from start to finish. Nonfiction books probably should be read from start to finish. Maybe you can jump around. When you study chess openings, you must study what is applicable to you. And what I mean by that, the simplest example of what I mean by this is, let's say you buy an E4 course, okay? Let's say you buy an E4 course. What should you learn? E5, C5. Learn what you face the most. Don't just go, all right, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Somebody said that. Like, I've got a lot of subscribers who are like, I, I studied the entire course. Then you, then, you, then you learn nothing. Then you learn nothing. All right? It's the same thing. I don't fear the man that has trained 10,000 kicks once. I fear the man... What was that? That Bruce, that Bruce Lee quote, right? I, think, I hope that's a Bruce Lee quote. The person that practiced the kick 10,000 times. That was the quote. All right? So, it's a balancing act. If you handle courses the wrong way, and you think that spending money equals results, courses are a waste of money. But if you take one course at a time, diligently learn what is applicable to your level instead of reading it like a book from start to finish, then it is worth the money. If like that's the way that you're going to study. You're going to be methodical. You're not going to cheat. You're not going to look at the courses while your games are going on. Then it's not a waste of money. Because we all have to spend a little bit of money on our hobbies. Especially, like, if you can. If you can't, that's okay. But don't try to buy 15 chess courses at a discount. That's a waste of money. Spend it on yourself. Take yourself to a nice dinner. All right? I thought this would be an interesting video. Uh, let me know if you want more stuff like this in the future. And, um... Till next time, I guess. Get out of here.